In fact, when, when uh, MMRDA's business plan was prepared in 2008, it was expected, as uh, Professor Peter pointed out, 35 to 40 percent of the total requirements, which was to the tune of uh, over 60 billion US dollars, was to come from private sector through PPP mode. But uh, as has been said, nothing much has come through. So how to, how to uh, substitute it with government money? So we need to have a very closer look at PPP. Can we, uh, where, where have we failed? Are there, are there any uh, flaws in the, in the basic structuring of the PPP itself or uh, some laws have to be made to address those issues? That's, that's uh, a potential is there, but somehow we need to have a relook re at that. In Mumbai, yes, uh, it, it's a very unique kind of uh, model. Uh, we assess the requirement of uh, infrastructure uh, investments. The, the average requirement is about rupees 16,000 crores per annum, out of which only 4,000 crores, roughly, uh, on an average, is coming through uh, ULBs. Of course, uh, Mumbai Municipal Corporation being the largest uh, contributor. Rupees 6,000 crores, on an average, per annum, is coming from different parastatals of uh, the state government, MMRDA being the major uh, shareholder in that. There are other agencies like uh, SIDCO or Mahada or uh, MSRDC. Still, there is a gap of uh, rupees 6,000 crore. Now, MMRD, of course, as I said, being a unique kind of uh, uh, system, we have been able to contribute uh, to a large extent in, in transport infrastructure, we are responsible to invest in metro corridors, in monorails, uh, other transport infrastructure like bridges and highways, etc. But that, that system may not be replicable. I mean, it has worked well because of uh, maybe by accident we, we could develop uh, land and uh, generate a lot of revenue which is working. And that was possible because uh, perhaps the environmental laws, the CRZ laws were not uh, there at that time when we developed the land. It may not be possible today or may, may not be possible in uh, all cities. At the end, I would also like to uh, say a few things about governance issues. Yes, finance is uh, very important, but governance is, is also very, very critical. And there is uh, some kind of ambiguity about the governance, particularly in metropolitan cities. We have, uh, as Professor Pete pointed out, 17 municipal bodies in uh, Mumbai metropolitan area. Mumbai metropolitan area is 10 times of the area of Mumbai city. So uh, there are a number of uh, uh, municipal bodies and urban uh, bodies within uh, the MMR. And lot of, a number of municipalities are in many ways uh, depending upon each other for their uh, infrastructure uh, uh, requirements, uh, availability, uh, etc. So what kind of uh, relationship should be there between one particular ULB with another ULB within the same metropolitan area so that they are not uh, either duplicating their work or uh, going in conflict with each other. Then you have this uh, regional development authority like MMRDA. There are similar, similar agencies like uh, Kolkata or Bangalore or Hyderabad. May not be exactly the same, but more or less on the same lines. So what kind of relationship should be there between uh, this regional development authority and uh, a ULB working within that area? Should there be any control by the, UL, by the regional development authority over uh, the municipality? No, it's very difficult because the constitutional uh, amendment and the existing laws recognize, uh, uh, recognize the, the municipal bodies, the ULBs, but regional development authorities have no mention anywhere in the law. I mean, this constitution doesn't even uh, give any locus standi to regional development authority. We are, we are there only with the statute of uh, the state government. So should there be an elected uh, government uh, at the, at the uh, regional uh, level also? So this will be then a fourth level of governance. We already have three levels and uh, there are issues about one level dealing with the other level. So we are adding, if we add another level, uh, would it be a workable and a feasible model? 
Now, in a way, MPC was supposed to be uh, an elected kind of governance at regional level. But as uh, is pointed out by uh, Professor Pete and many of you also would agree that MPCs are really uh, important bodies. I mean, it's it's more as the, the, the constitution itself is to work as a committee rather than uh, as, as an organization or as an agency. So, I mean, the role of each of uh, these uh, bodies, whether it's a regional uh, authority or uh, the municipal bodies, that needs to be redefined so that uh, we can work we can work in the same direction rather than working in conflict with each other. I mean, I I, I can I can only raise these or flag these issues. I have no uh, answers or recommendations to make, and I'm sure. Uh, the researchers uh, like you who have written so much, uh, very, very relevant in, in the book, perhaps can give some more thought on this issue because this is extremely relevant. I mean, finance or no finance, finance we have some, it may not be the required level, but the governance issue uh, with finance also would, would uh, not give us the desired kind of output. Thank you. Dr. Atin Ray. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Aluwalia, to comment on what is a very interesting book, a range of books, actually, on what is becoming an important topic. And also, thank you for inviting, in, in serial order, three Bombayites, because I'm also from Bombay, <laughs> and Dr. Pete is from Bombay, and you are. So there seems to be some shifting in the, in the sort of metropolitan balance of power. Hopefully, this is not a one-off. Uh, this is something that Tishar is trailblazing. OK, I think I'll take off uh, from uh, a point that you made, Mr. Madan, about the link between finance and governance, because I want to just make three headline points in the context of Abe's presentation and the book. The first is that <clears throat> when we talk about uh, you know, resource mobilization and public spending in a city, the word city, herbs, uh, my own city was called, I hope it still is, herbs prima in this. We had a motto, and herbs mean something, right, from Latin. It actually means a living socio-political space. It's not a technical construct which is created or something that is therefore devoid of history. It has identity, and it has a politics. So the public finances of a city, whether we are referring to taxes or user charges, which are not prices for a reason, they have a political dimension because they pertain to public goods, must involve in some way a relationship with the political settlement that exists in the city. In India, I'm afraid that political settlement is profoundly lacking and has in fact atrophied in the case of the presidency cities over the last 60 or 70 years. And therefore, to take up Mr. Badan's point, I think unless that changes, it is, I think, impractical to talk about anything other than what I would term the grace and favor arrangements that cities have to tolerate, such as extra attention or not from a finance commission, which is fundamentally a technocratic body, extra attention or not from a state government, depending on the vicissitudes of state politics. If, uh, if, you, if you wish to look outside, just think of the evolution of a, a mega city like New York to see what I mean. This is a journey that happens, and equilibrium happens, and therefore a stable public finance equilibrium happens when a political settlement for a city is defined. In the case of uh, all our cities, we would have people speaking about, you, you mentioned this with, with your permission, you used a phrase, my finance secretary. That is exactly the problem that I'm referring to. In a situation where the, the chief executive of a city authority thinks in terms of ownership of the state government uh, as being the owner, then the political process which the city is engaged with, the political settlement can only happen at the level of the state. And nowhere is this tension more uh, evident than in, in this particular metropolitan herb, Delhi, where we have an amorphous state government. The police here reports, in fact, I don't know how many of you know this, uh, to the central government. And this was controversial very recently. Uh, so in effect, what you have is, is, is what you were calling this, uh, you used a very good phrase, this sort of mosaic, in which accountability is gone. And what you get, therefore, is, is stodgy, well-intentioned, but ultimately stodgy and ineffective bureaucratic delivery of services. So I think the first thing we will need to do before we discuss tax assignments is take a decision 
on whether it is feasible and possible to think about a political authority taking charge, and I have two metrics for that. There is no way under the sun that a political authority cannot run the two chief executives of a city that are most important, the municipal commissioner and the police commissioner. Law and order and the municipalities must report to a political authority. That will then give you a budgetary process, a political settlement, it will be messy. Dr. Mohanty mentions on page 118 of his book the rising levels of urban inequality and what it means. And I know what it means. It typically means I've lived in Brazil. Uh, I see what, what happened in Brasilia where I lived, and in fact in Sao Paulo replicated in my own city here, where high rises come up at the periphery to feed essentially uh, workers who are productive, while you have low density you know, city centers in which the relatively rich or the relatively well connected live. So that process being replicated, that will have implications for the political settlement, and therefore I, my own opinion is that the technocratic approach to running cities, where essentially the political authority of that city rests somewhere else, will not change. So it has to change. Related to this, of course, is the idea of expectations. I think one finance, public finance problem we have, and I think you mentioned this and you did too, is that expectations are benchmarked well ahead of the state of development of the country in which the city is located. And this is a fairly common problem. I think in India it's exacerbated because our presidency towns, which were original cities, Bombay, Delhi, Calcutta, did receive privileged treatment, historically. You know, Jaipur didn't. And of course, Hyderabad, an important city, but it was a disarmed capital. And Delhi, of course, has been mollycoddled now for 65 years. You were saying this very rightly. Uh, so, and that has led to people's expectations being benchmarked way ahead of possibly what extant public finance uh, you know, resource delivery mechanisms can provide. So the challenge here would be to manage expectations, and again, this will have to be tied in, ultimately, with a political settlement being evolved and being derived. Uh, in this context, therefore, I am not uh, sanguine at all about the role of regional metropolitan development authorities. I share your concern that you cannot possibly politicize these. You can, of course, have these as techno technocratic sort of coordination arms, a sort of metropolitan planning commission. And the way to do that would be to create literally a regional corporation and then get empowered municipal corporations that buy into that to uh, fund it and finance it. So you'd have MMRDA, but MMRDA would not be the arm of the state government for distributing largest to Mumbai Thane and, and Navi Mumbai, but would actually become a corporation in which Mumbai Thane and Navi Mumbai would invest. But that would require, which we have luckily I think as of now in Mumbai Atayana, that, we, that when you live in Thane or Navi Mumbai, you think of yourself as a Mumbaikar. So that is what I mean by that sort of identity. But I think these are very important priors when we are going to discuss options. So I'll make my final economics point. These were political economy points. I think they're very important because we often lose them. And I think there's very good research now which tells us what we need to do in terms of assignments. You mentioned them at the beginning. But I, perhaps there's one point that I'd really like a discussion on this. This is something that strikes me which is looking at you know, many developing countries, Brazil, India, <coughs> Thailand, places I've lived in my life, uh, mainly India, but Brazil and Thailand. You know, cities have, uh, in terms of resources that flow into cities, there are two things that have happened. One is that cities become the location in an economy which is sclerotic, where investment opportunities are limited. India, macroeconomically, 12% of our savings doesn't see a bank, right? It's physical savings, housing and gold. So, a lot of these savings are rents generated outside the city in the city hinterland. And sometimes, as in the case of Mumbai, the hinterland may be huge. And those rents come into a city. And I invested there. The second thing that then happens is uh, if the city clicks, then rents begin to be generated in that city because by the very nature of a city, there are shortages. You mentioned two important things, land values and others, and those generate rents. So what you see in city economies is a sea of rents. Now, one important rule in public finance is it's great when you have rents if you can tax them. Old rule, tax rents, not profits, or not assets. But we also know in public finance that the most difficult thing to tax are rents in terms of developing the algorithm to tax them, which is why our circle property tax rates always significantly lag what exists in the market. It's, it's a logical thing, it's bound to happen, because what determines property prices in our cities are rents. So the biggest resource base available to a city which is rents, is also the one that is most notoriously difficult to tax. This is a problem that I think merits closer